so now today i will start and we'll start a new topic trusses and we will see what is a truss and how do we analyze the truss from a mechanics view point now you may have seen cranes or telephone towers and typically a telephone tower has a structure like this and it's a three dimensional structure i'm showing only two dimensions you have different straight line members which are connected to each other and then the way this design is done is because this has some rigidity and loads are applied on different points on this member and this is able to withstand the load so this is an example of what we call as a truss so let me first go with the formal definition of a truss a truss is a system of members which are fastened together at their ends to support stationary or moving loads so we have a lot of members for example here each of these each of these straight line thing a small this thing is a member and they are fastened together at the ends in a truss normally the members are fastened only at the end so now we have basically most of these members you will see they will be slender bars they will be bars which are thin so in a truss so in typically a truss type of structure you will also see it at the end of a bridge is a structure like this on one end you will have it like this and then you have these different type of members which are connected each of these members so each of these bars which are there they are connected to each other at ends so in each of the bars is called a member and what we will see in today's class and the next class is how do we carry out what are the forces which are coming across to each of the members when a load is applied on a truss now what we find is if you look at if you see as i told you that this is what you see at the end of a bridge now if you take a magnified view of this joint what you typically will find is that members of a truss are either riveted or bolted or welded to intermediate elements so what we find is if i look at a blown up picture of this joint what i will find is that this will be something like a plate and the different members which are there they are riveted to this intermediate member this intermediate member on which all these so this is what we call as the members or bars of a truss they are connected to this plate which we call as a gusset plate now one of the things which makes this truss is or what is taken into account is that the centroidal 
axes of all the members is concurrent. What do we mean by centroidal axis? Each of these members is actually some cylindrical structure or some I-shaped member, square type of member. If I take the centroid of that area of the cross section and join it, then this axis of which joins all the centroids of the cross-sectional areas is called the centroidal axis. And what we find is the way these members are joined in the truss, the centroidal axis, if we extend them, then all of these will intersect at one point. So, this is how the members of a truss are joined. Now, what we find is that in a truss, the truss design is such that external loads on a truss are normally applied to the joints. So, for example, if I have a truss structure like this, if this is my truss structure, all these are members, then external forces will be applied. So, for example, a force F1 is applied here, a force F2 is applied here, a force F3 is applied here. We do not normally forces are not applied on the members. So, the force is applied on the joint but just to illustrate, this type of a force F3 will not be applied. So, normally it may be applied, but the way a truss is designed, external loads do not come on the members, they come only at a joint. So, and this really leads to a particular this thing that if so the consequence of this is that if center lines of the members are concurrent in a coplanar case then the gusset plate can be replaced by a simple spin joint. So, since all the center members are intersecting at a point, then we can replace the gusset plate by a simple pin joint at the point of concurrence. And this you will see will add or will cause the analysis of the trust to become simplistic. So, this is what we do in a coplanar case. Actually, we have two types of trusses. There can be more classi classifications. This is two types of trusses based on dimensionality. The first type is a plane truss and that is what we will focus on in this series of lectures. In this lecture, I will talk of plane trusses in which the members and loading are coplanar. That means the whole truss is in one plane. And example of this is sides of a bridge or in roof, if you see the design of a roof, the roof design is always in the design of a truss and in a roof design we will find planar truss. The second type of truss which you may have guessed is what we call as a 
space truss which is basically a three dimensional arrangement of members so here now the arrangement is not restricted to one plane it is a three dimensional arrangement in an examples of this are tower when you see uh, a tower from truss uh, in towers you will see trusses of this type electric power transmission there you see any trusses there will be of this type in a crane the truss which you see will be a three dimensional truss now for a plane truss we see that the joint or the gusset plate is replaced by a pin joint now for a 3d or a space truss the the joint is assumed to be a ball and socket joint and the reason for this is that all the members are going to be concurrent so we will assume this to be a ball and socket joint which means can transmit only forces and no moments and the same thing happens with a pin joint also that it is able to transmit only forces it cannot transmit any moments now one thing we find is that the members of a truss are generally long and slender what do we mean by slender that the length corresponding to the cross sectional area is much less than the length of the member so for example if this is the shape of a member in this case radius will be the length corresponding to the cross sectional area and this is the length l so r is much less than l now this need not be circular member it could be a rectangular member or it could be a square member if it is a square member then r will be the dimension of that uh, side of the square if it is a rectangle then it would be the length of either of the sides of the rectangle that will be much less than the length so this is what we mean by a slender member so now let's look at some of the assumptions we will make when we so in a truss what we find is external loads are applied only on the joints but then what happens if for example what do you do of the weight weight is an external load and this is acting all along the beam weight is acting at each point so when we analyze a truss where weight of members is not negligible then we assume the weight acts equally on the two joints 
which are connected to the member so i am telling you in case if weight is not to be neglected let us say we have this member i am taking a very simple case of a truss like this let us say this is joint a this is joint b this is joint c this is joint d this is joint e this is member 1 this is member 2 3 4 5 6 7 so now if in most of the cases what we'll find is that the external forces which are acting let us say we have a 100 kilo newton force acting on d and we have a 50 kilo newton force acting on b then the weight of the members in a lot of cases will be much less than applied loads and can be neglected but in case if it cannot be neglected then what we will assume is if the weight of each of these is w1 w2 this is w1 w2 w3 etc these are the weights of the members then what we will do is when we analyze the truss so i'll put both these pictures together this is the original picture and when we analyze this then what i will do is the weight of member 1 is w1 so what i will assume is w1 by 2 comes on point a and w1 by 2 comes on point b why because one is connected to ab so half of the load comes on joint a half of the weight comes on joint b now in addition to this i already see b has a 50 kilo newton's load then let us see what happens to bd bd is w2 so w2 means on this i will get w2 by 2 and on d i will get w2 by 2 because of bd then we see there is a 100 kilo newtons load already acting on d then let me do for bc for bc what will happen is the weight is w3 so w3 by 2 comes on b and w3 by 2 also will come on c then when i go to c this is number 1 2 3 let's go to ac ac is w4 so therefore what will happen is W4 by 2 will come on A, and W4 by 2, another W4 by 2 will come on C. So similarly, we do it for each of the member. If the weight is not to be neglected, half of it will come on each of the joint which is coming. So therefore, a joint, for example, a joint like D, in this case will have a load of W2 by 2, W5 by 2, and W7 by 2. will come on d on joint b we will get w1 by 2 w3 by 2 and w2 by 2 on joint a we will get w1 by 2 and w4 by 2 on joint c we will get w4 by 2 w3 by 2 w5 by 2 and w6 by 2 all of that will act on joint c and so on so this is what we do when one question when weights cannot be neglected okay let me take up the question from vce yes please yes uh okay i i cannot hear you maybe you can type it in please or you try to connect the mic your mic is not working yeah. your mic is not working i cannot listen to you this is i am requesting vce i cannot hear you your mic is not working so either please correct it or type your question and send it in and i will answer it as soon as i see it so let me continue now till this problem is resolved please type your question and send it back and i will address it try to address it in today's class itself once again anyway i have getting some queries i will still 
just for completion at the middle of the class i will put in my email address again sanjeev sanghi at gmail.com or if they are students then on facebook you could see me and you could send queries to me my facebook id is sanjeev sanghi so one of the two ways you can get in touch with me for any queries and anything okay so let's continue our discussion on trusses so what we have seen is that external loads in a truss will only come on a joint and what we have also seen is so we have seen external load only comes on a joint and even if we have even weight is treated as a force on the joints we do not treat weight as a load on the member so what if we look at each member of a truss what we find is it is connected by a pin joint and the load is coming only at the two ends so what is the implication of this in terms of mechanics in terms of statics problems what this means is that each member of a truss is treated as a two force member so that means each member of a truss is a two force member now what are the implications of this first let us talk of in most cases we will find only straight members in the truss if we have a straight member let us say a member ab now because forces are acting only at a and b and this is a two force member what this implies is that the force structure will be either we will have forces at a and b like this or we will have forces in a and b like this remember what we said the equilibrium of a two force member it dictates to us that the forces acting at the two points where the forces are acting are equal and opposite and they pass through the line joining these two points so that means in a straight line member when we have a, a truss member when we look at it the joint on the truss will be uh, the force on the truss will be something of this type so now when i look at this if i look at this member ab and when i see that on the member the joints are exerting forces like this this situation is termed as compression and when the joints are pulling the member away from each other this situation is termed as tension so when i look at a straight member in a truss it is either in a state of tension or in a state of compression and what we realize is let's look at this member ab this is member ab and let's say it is in a state of tension this is the force acting at the two ends now if i cut a section xx and draw a free body diagram of section xx at point a we have a force which is acting like this now at this section xx remember what is our general rule when we cut a member we will get a force and a moment so if i look at it generally what i should get should be a general force which could be in any direction and there should be a moment but now if i take if i carry out an equilibrium analysis on the cut section then what i get is if i take moments about a is equal to 
so firstly what i will get is because this is a two force member so this cut section if what if i take moments about this point is equal to zero let's take moments about the cut section not a let's take it moments about this section is equal to zero then the point a is passing through this this force is passing through this so what i will get is that this moment has to be zero and the force has got to be equal to t in the opposite direction so therefore when i cut a member so this is the member ab this is in tension like this when i cut it up at the cut section i will get a single force which is equal to the tension and there will be no moment this is only if this happens when we have a two force member which is cut and it is cut it is the forces are acting between the lines joining the two forces so therefore each member so what we find is each member of a straight member truss has an internal force only and this force is along the line of the member and the force is either tensile which means the member is being pulled or compressive so therefore in a straight member we report the force in a member as a force which we say so many newtons and then we will say t or c t denotes tensile and c denotes compressive and this could be newtons or kilonewtons so we will have the force is 2 kilo newtons 2000 newtons 5000 newtons and instead of showing the direction we will just show tensile or compressive that means when we talk of forces in a straight member truss then we will not say it is so much i plus so much j we will because once the two points a and b are known then it is implied that the force is along this direction of ab and we give the sense of the force by either stating it as tensile or stating it as compressive and if we have a member ab like this and i am cutting the member a here a tensile force is a force away from the member so therefore if i am cutting the section this is cutting the section at a if i cut the section at b the force which points away from the member at the cut section this is a tensile force and let me put a compressive force in the red direction if the if the force is acting in this direction this is what is compressing the member so then if the section is cut at b the compressive force will act like this so therefore we don't give the sense or the force by i or j direction we just write so many newtons tensile so many newtons compressive now the question you may ask is why did i insist on a straight member so next let us see what happens if one of the member let's say of the truss is a curved member now in this case for overall analysis of a truss of the truss we can replace the curved member ab by a a straight line member ab so if you have to carry out the full analysis of the truss we can replace the curved member by a single member but now so that means the force at a and b 
will be either a force F1 like this or it will be F2 like this. As far as the ends AB go, this is how, because this is a two force member, this will be how the forces will be acting. But the difference will come if I take a curved section XX in this curved member. If I take a cut section, so this is point A, this is point B, we know the force at A is passing through B, so this is the direction. Now when I make a cut section here, then I will show a force here, a force in the perpendicular direction. So let us say this is F1, this is known to me, this is Fx, Fy, these are not known and there is a moment. And now what you will realize is that if we have to do, if equilibrium has to hold, then what we get is Fx is equal to minus F1, that means Fx has to be equal and opposite. But now what you will realize is the moment will not be zero. So that means in a curved member, we cannot, so in a curved member, at a cut section, moment is not equal to zero. Okay? Because that is what your equilibrium will tell you, that there has to be a moment for this member to be in equilibrium. And therefore, for a curved member, we cannot talk of force being tensile or compressive alone, because at a cut section, we will also get uh, this thing, a, a, a moment which will not be equal to zero. So next, let us see uh, uh, a sort of another sort of classification of a truss, which is before we come to the solution of the truss, which hopefully I will look. But we have another thing which we call as a simple truss and or a just rigid truss. And what we have is a truss. is said to be just rigid if removal of any one member destroys its rigidity. That means you remove one member, what you will see is that the truss can start to oscillate or it can start to move. And you may have seen things like this. Suppose, for example, you have a stool. You may have seen that in a stool, if we have, if I look at the top cross section of a stool legs, so we have four legs of a stool like this. If we have something like this, you will see, normally you will find there is one more bar which is put here. If you remove this middle bar, then you will find the whole structure can shake. But putting this middle bar makes the whole thing rigid. And the rule for this is as follows. So let us look at the case in a plain truss and what we call a simple truss, which will be just rigid. We start with a triangle. We start with three members. So start with a triangle. Now a triangular structure will be rigid. So we start with uh, three members, three joints and three members. Now how do we make this truss big? How do we increase the size of the truss? We add one joint. So let us say we add the joint D. So now what you will do is to each new joint you add two members. So if I have a joint D, I have to put BD, I have to put DC. So I have put two more members, this will be rigid. Now I put another pin 
80. So now I have to put two more members. I put a member DC, I put a member CE, and so on. So now if I put a pin at F, I have to put DF, I have to put EF. I put a pin at G, I have to put CG, I have to put EG. And this way I can keep on extending the truss and it will be just, it will be up there just rigid truss. So for a planar, just rigid truss, the, it goes like this, you start with a triangle and then to each new pin we join two members and we keep on extending like this. And what we find is the formula for this works out to be m is equal to 2j minus 3 where m is equal to the number of members or the number of bars and j is equal to the number of joints. So we keep on adding as long as we follow this it will be a just rigid truss. If the number of members is greater, then this will be an over rigid truss and if the number is less, then it will be a mechanism. That means there will be some degrees of freedom and the whole thing can shake. So this is the base formula for a just rigid truss. Now similar to this, if we talk of a space truss, I will not be doing any analysis of space truss. Here what we do is, we start with a tetrahedron. Tetrahedron means uh, a base is a triangle, you put a fourth point, so we have three joints A, B, C, you put a fourth joint D, A, B, C are connected as a triangle, D is not in the same plane, you connect A to D, B to D and C to D, you get a tetrahedron. Now each of these here, A, C, D, these are joints which means they are ball and socket joints. Now you put a new joint and you connect just as you added two members in a planar truss, here we have to add three so I put E, I connect D to this, I connect C to this, I connect B to this and this way I keep on adding tetrahedrons and that is what gives me a just rigid space truss. So for a just rigid space truss and you can see the formula for a just rigid space truss what you will get is m is equal to 3j minus 6. We had this as equal to 2j minus 3 for a plane truss, for a space truss this will be 3j minus 6. So this is basically what we have in the theory of truss but then in types of problems what we have is let us start with solution of a simple truss. So and as far as the solution part goes we will only be considering planar trusses with straight members. I have given you what happens when we have spatial truss or when we have curved members but the problems we will be focusing in will be just this and let me to illustrate this let me take a very simple example let me tell you the type of problems and the type of problems will be that you will be given a truss and the external load acting on the truss and you have to find the force in a particular or all members of the truss. 
now when i say find a force because these are straight members the force in a truss will mean it will be a single force and you have to write this force as either a tensile or a compressive force we will not write the force as force is equal to so 10i plus 5j we'll just put it as square root of 10 square plus 5 square whatever that number is so many newtons and the answer will say t or c and that is how these will be expressed so let us look at a very very simple example before we move ahead so suppose we have i'm making a very simple truss with just we have this truss this is point a all of these are joints so now point a is connected to the ground with a pin joint and now we have this is point b this is c this is d this is e this is f and point f of the truss is also connected to the joint but this is on rollers and what we have is on point b there is a 1000 newton force on point e there is a 1000 newton force and what we are told is the length of each of the of each horizontal or vertical member is equal to 10 newton uh i'm just putting it let me let's say it is 10 okay we said 10 meters it may not be so that means this is 10 this is 10 obviously if these two are 10 this will be 10 root 2 10 root 2 this is 10 this is 10 this is 10 this is 10 root 2 so this is all given to us the loading external forces acting on the truss are given the geometry of the truss all the angles or all the lengths they are given to us and we have to find the force in each member of the truss that means find the force in ac find the force in cb bd cd be de and df now what we are going to use to solve this problem there'll be two method and we'll illustrate this solution by what we call as the method of method of joints and this method is useful if we have to find force in all the members or force in most of the members of the truss and this is also useful when we have to computerize we have to write a software code to find members in the truss now step 1 in the solution will be we will first find the external forces on the supports and to do this we have to draw free body diagram of the pull truss so first thing we will do is we will find the external forces on the support now where are the external where is this truss being supported clearly you see the truss is connected to the ground at a and f so the first thing will be to find the forces in a and f and for which we draw the free body diagram of the truss so let me do that and while doing that i will keep this picture handy so that you can have a look at this i have put a second paper below let me now draw a free body diagram of the truss so first i will draw the truss this is the truss i have points a b c d e f now in this free body diagram 
because i am drawing the free body diagram of the truss i have to only show external forces now what is happening at point a point a is connected to the ground with a pin so that means from the ground i will get ay and ax this is the two external forces which will come on point a let's look at point f point f is on roller support so that means no x force will come so on point f we'll get just f sub y these are the forces which come from the supports in addition to this i have a thousand newton force here and a thousand newton force here so now what i will do is each of these lengths is 10 so let's now carry out an equilibrium equilibrium when i carry out when i do sigma fx is equal to 0 i will get ax is equal to 0 notice in this free body diagram i will not put any internal forces the force which joint c is exerting on a etc will not be put so first i get ax is equal to 0 next i continue with the equilibrium i do sigma fy is equal to 0 this will be ay plus fy is equal to 2000 and some of you instead of writing this equation will directly write moments about a is equal to 0 so let me write the moments about a let me take the moments in the clockwise direction so what i will get is this will give me 10 multiplied by 1000 plus 10 20 multiplied by 1000 Minus thirty multiplied by y is equal to zero. Moments about a. I think all of you should be able to get this equation. And when you get this, what you will get is f sub y is equal to thousand newtons, and this will imply a sub y is also thousand newtons. So this is the first step. We work out all the external forces on the truss. now let us look at the diagram of the truss carefully we know the external forces at a and f now what we will do is we will start and analyze each joint and the first joint to be analyzed so we start and analyze each joint and we start with joint connected to only two members now why do we do this that means what we are going to do is we will draw free body diagram of each of these joints only of the joint at a joint at c joint at b and we do the analysis now if i draw the free body diagram of the joint what i will find is all the forces will pass through the joint therefore i will not get any new equation by taking moments moments about the joint point will automatically be zero so that means i will get only two equations when i analyze the joint sigma fx is equal to zero sigma fy is equal to zero and that is why we start with the joint connected to only two members because equations of equilibrium for a joint will give only two equations sigma fx is equal to 0 and sigma fy is equal to 0 moment about joint is equal to 0 is already satisfied irrespective of the values so therefore let us draw so we we'll, first we will draw in this case we find there are only two joints which are connected to two members joint a and joint f so we draw the free body diagram 
of joint A. And once again, what I will do is let me put the original picture simultaneously with this so that you are able to analyze this better. So now, when I draw the free body diagram of joint A, so what I will do is I will remove everything else, just keep joint A. Now, what do I know about joint A? I know on joint A, first of all, there is a force Ay is equal to 1000 newtons. This I know from the free body diagram of the entire body. Now, on joint A, I have the member AB which is connected and I have the member AC which is connected. So, what I will do is, let me show. Now, the force along AB is along the direction of AB. I show it as AB. And the force along AC, this is along the direction of AC. And in this, this particular problem, we know because the horizontal and vertical lengths are equal, this angle is 45 degrees. Now, the unknown forces, I can assume it to be in any direction. And as you will see, we have assumed the unknown forces in AB and AC as tensile. We have assumed AB and AC are in tension. Does it surprise you? Some of you will be surprised. What I am showing is AB is being compressed. Why do I call it as tensile? And the answer to that is we are drawing the free body diagram of the joint. Free body diagram of the member will show opposite forces. So, a tensile force in AB, which will pull member AB, when I look at a joint, the tensile force will pull the joint and the joint will then pull the member. So, these AB and AC are shown, these as I have assumed, I have assumed them to be tensile. Is that clear? I think this is something which all of you have to understand. And uh, uh, now, let's see. So, let's do a force balance. We do sigma fx is equal to 0. That will give me AB plus AC cos 45 is equal to 0. I don't know the values of AB and AC. Next, let us do in this itself. Let's continue with this and we do Having done sigma fx is equal to 0, I will do sigma fy is equal to 0. So, now what I will get is AC cos 45 degrees plus 1000 is equal to 0. So, this gives me AC is equal to minus 1000 divided by cos 45 degrees. So, this is minus 1000 root 2 newtons. Now, what does this tell? Since I had assumed AC to be tensile, that means AC is equal to, the force in AC is 1000 root 2 newtons compressive. Because I had assumed the force to be tensile, I am getting a minus sign, so I get this. And AB is equal to minus AC cos 45. So, this is equal to 1000 Newtons and this will be inside. So, what I have from here is that AB, I have assumed it to be correct and AC is opposite. So, AC is 1000 root 2 compressive and AB is 1000, these are all Newtons tensile. So, let us come back to the original figure. This was the joint which we had. We have now found force in member AC, force in member AB. 
we have to now move to the adjacent joint we can either move to point b or we can move to point c which one will be moved to to b or to c and the logical choice will be c because we already know ac so now there are two more members connected to c so that means the next joint which we will move on to so the second joint we move on to is the joint c and in joint c what we have is that this force we have now this force is ac this is 1000 root to newtons and now because i know this is compressive i show the right direction so this is shown with the correct direction because this one is known now we have cd and bc which are connected to this so we have cd so this is cd and we have bc cd and bc you will see they have been assumed tensile so now we do sigma fx is equal to 0 sigma fy is equal to 0 if i do sigma fx is equal to 0 this will give me cd plus 1000 is equal to 0 and sigma fy is equal to 0 will give me bc is equal to 1000 so the time is about to be over so what we get is cd is equal to 1000 newtons compressive and bc is equal to 1000 newtons tensile and once i know this i can move on to the next joint and keep on solving my problem so then i will move to the joint at b and from here i will move to the joint at b and then to e or d and then i will solve my problem so this is how one solves a truss problem by method of joints uh we will continue this discussion there are some more things to be taken in truss which i will take up in the next class okay thank you very much uh, if there are any queries you can mail them or you can send them or you can email to me once again the email address sanjeev sanghi at gmail.com thank you